so far we've been learning about fluid statics. So how do fluids behave when they're just sitting still? And now we'll learn about fluid mechanics. Or how fluids move. And so remember that fluids are gases or liquids. And so this will, today and Wednesday, we'll describe how fluids move. So the first equation that we're going to define is the flow rate. And we represent that with the variable capital Q. And it equals the volume divided by time. So if you had this volume of water in this pipe, so this water has some volume V, and you could measure some time that it took to move and that would give you your volume and your time and you could calculate the flow rate. So on the next slide, I'll show a different formula for flow rate. So we said that flow rate was volume over time. And if we, let's say we used a pipe as an example, So this is just a cylinder, so the volume of a cylinder is equal to the cross-sectional area of the cylinder times the length. So the cross-sectional area with this would be pi r squared. And then the length of this cylinder would be L. So if we rewrote our equation for flow rate, so volume is area times L divided by T. And then 
uh, what is something that has units of length over time or distance over time? Velocity. So this is area times velocity. So we have two different definitions for flow rate. It's either the volume over time or it's the cross-sectional area times the velocity. And so if you look at this cylinder, so what you would be calculating is this is the cross-section that we're looking at and there's fluid flowing through this, then this velocity is the average velocity of the fluid. through the cross-sectional area. So we start off with this equation for flow rate as volume over time. And then if you replace volume with cross-sectional area times a length or a distance, then we get a length over a time, which we know as the same units as velocity. And so we have two distinct equations for flow rate. Now, most of the fluids that we will be looking at in this class, if not all of them, are incompressible And a consequence of this is if we have a pipe that starts off big and then becomes narrower, then because the fluid is incompressible, the flow rate through this part of the uh, pipe has to be the same as the flow rate through the narrower part of the pipe. So Q1 has to equal Q2. So if we use our equation that we had for flow rate previously, that the flow rate is equal to the area times the velocity, so conceptually, if the area in part one is bigger than the area in part two, Will the velocity in part two be bigger or smaller than the velocity in part one? Uh, 
of V2 is bigger. Yeah. And so let's work uh, an example problem to see that. So, so our intuition is that V2 should be bigger than V1. And so let's plug in some numbers here. So let's say that R1 is one meter, R2, let's say R1 is three meters, R1 or R2 is one meter. And we'll, we'll say that the average velocity of the fluid here is two meters per second. And then we wanna find the average velocity of the fluid in the smaller part of the pipe. So pi r1 squared v1 equals pi r2 squared v2. So your pi's cancel. If we're solving for v2, we would divide the r2 squared to the other side. And then plugging in our numbers, we would get three squared over one squared. times two, so we would get 18 meters per second. So if you're given some system where the cross-sectional area changes, then you can use this relationship that the flow rate for an incompressible liquid has to be the same. So now we're going to talk about another equation called Bernoulli's equation. And I'll write it down first, and then we can see where it comes from afterwards. So Bernoulli's equation is pressure plus one half rho B squared plus rho GH is a constant. So this is pressure. This is density, this is velocity, density, acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, and then height. And so because if you add all these things together, uh, you'll get a constant, we can set so P1 plus one half rho B1 squared plus rho G H1 equals pressure two plus one half rho B2 squared plus rho GH2. So if we look at these two terms, and then this equality that I wrote at the bottom, does this remind you of anything? that we've already seen. 
Yeah, so this looks a lot like energy and energy conservation, right? So this one kind of looks like kinetic energy. This one kind of looks like potential energy. And this kind of looks like conservation of energy. So that's good that you have that intuition. And now we'll see where these individual terms come from and how they all relate together. So let's look at the kinetic term first. So we have this one half rho v squared term. And we said that this looks like kinetic energy. So if I started with kinetic energy, one half mv squared, do you guys remember how to get a density into your equation if it starts out as a mass? So if you remember the PLTL we did with the dam, we had a one half mv squared, and we somehow changed that m into a density. All right, so what's the density equation? All right. So basically, if we take this kinetic energy and we divide it by the volume. Then the right hand side would be one half mass over volume times velocity. And then mass over volume is just density. And so we would get one half density times velocity squared. So all this term is in the Bernoulli's equation is just the kinetic energy divided by the volume. So if we do a similar operation for the potential energy due to gravity, then we would get the same thing. So maybe I'll do that down here. So the potential energy from gravity is MGH. If we divide everything by the volume, then we have M over volume times GH, which is just density GH. So if we look back at our Bernoulli's equation that we had written down, we would see that the, the one half rho v squared term and the rho gh term are the kinetic and potential energies respectively divided by the volume. Go back to you. The last term, which was just the pressure. So pressure was also in there. So is there any way that we can relate that to something divided by volume? So we know that pressure is force over area. And the units for force are Newton, 
the unit for area is meters squared. And then the unit for Newton, if we broke that into its components is kilogram meter per second squared. There's still a meter squared down at the bottom. Oh, this should just be <clears throat> so if I took this kilogram meter over meter squared second squared. and I wanted there to be a volume in the denominator, then I would multiply the top and the bottom by another meter term. And I'm, as long as I multiply the top and the bottom by the same thing, that's just multiplying by one. So I'm not changing the units on this thing. Okay, so now I've got a meter cubed on the bottom. And so if I separate out that unit, one over meter cubed, and then I have units that are meter squared or kilogram, meter squared over second squared. What are the units of this thing in red brackets? So this is the same thing as a joule. So this is the unit for energy. And so another way to think about pressure is that pressure is a is energy per volume. And so if we look at uh, if we look back at our Bernoulli's equation, this thing that we said looks like conservation of energy is conservation of energy just divided everything by the volume. So as long as you divide both sides by the same thing, then it's still true. So it's still a true statement. So all we've done is taken conservation of energy and divided both sides by the volume. And so the same problem solving techniques that we use to do conservation of energy equations, we can do with this Bernoulli's equation that governs fluids. And so we can do some examples. So if we start off with this, Then there's a couple different types of questions that you'll see. So if we look at the problems that we were just working on,
So if we said that there isn't really a change in height here for H1 equals H2, then we could cancel out these two terms. Yes. If we had, so if we look back at our, static pressure situation where things weren't moving and we calculated that the as you go deeper in a fluid the pressure increases So if we look at this Bernoulli's equation, if the And so this thing is filled with fluid. And this fluid was stationary, so there's no velocity. So V1 and V2 are both zero. then we can cancel out both of those velocities. And now we've got this equation. And now you can set the the height of this thing. Let's say you set this height to be equal to zero. What I want to be there. Yeah, I guess either way works. So if we set that height to be zero, then this first term would go away. No, I guess I want to do it the other way. We'll set our height to be zero down here. And so that would make this term go away. And then you can see that pressure two, so if this is, so this is height two, this is height one. So this would be pressure one at the top and pressure two at the bottom. You can see that pressure two is whatever the pressure at the top is plus Row GH1. So all of the density times gravity times the height that's above the water plus whatever pressure is at the top will equal the pressure at the bottom. So 
this tells you that P2 is bigger than P1. And so if you look back at your notes, this rho GH term is the is what we calculated for the pressure differential in a different way. Uh, but it's good to see that this new equation that we've just defined, Bernoulli's equation, also gives us the same result. And so any of your static fluid problems, you can use Bernoulli's equation and just set the velocities to be zero or in equations where the fluid is moving, but it's not moving up or down, it's just moving horizontally. Then you can set your change in height to be zero. And so those two terms would cancel. Um, so there's some ways that you can simplify the problem. Okay. And then one more thing uh, before we go. So we said that this Bernoulli's equation was basically the analog for conservation of energy, and you just divide that by the volume, and that's how it applies to fluids. So if we remember power was energy divided by time, or change in energy over change in time, And so the analog for that for fluids is taking our analog to energy that we had and then multiplying that by Q. And so if you look at the units for these things, this unit was joule or energy divided by volume. And the unit for Q, which was the flow rate that we defined earlier, is volume per time. Then you would see that these volume units cancel, and we get a unit for energy divided by time, which is the unit that we need for power. So if you take that Bernoulli's equation and you multiply it by the flow rate Q, then you can get the power that is being delivered by some fluid that's flowing at this flow rate Q. Yep. So there is, but it's capital P. So, so uh, there's only so many letters. So I didn't want to write power and have people confuse it with pressure. So that's why I just wrote it out as power. So any other questions? All right, if not, then you guys are good to go. Next, next time we'll talk about how this applies to things like airplanes and how they can fly and how sailboats work uh, with the sail. And sometimes it can work even if the sail is, you can sail into the wind basically. So we'll talk about that 